All right, welcome to one of my favorite chapters of this class, Chapter 7. We're going to learn more about hurricanes and discuss thunderstorms and tornadoes. So common terms that we usually find when we talk about severe weather include hurricanes and typhoons. We'll talk about the difference between the two. Cyclone, exactly what a thunderstorm is. The difference between thunder and lightning why vertical wind shear is so important in the development of certain kinds of thunderstorms and tornadoes, what a mesocyclone is, a tornado, and something called the enhanced Fujita scale. So the first thing we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about hurricanes. And this is a 3D, basically a three-dimensional satellite image of Hurricane Katrina in the Gulf of Mexico. You probably already have heard of Hurricane Katrina, and we'll talk more about this hurricane later on in this chapter. So what do we need for hurricanes? And you might be wondering why certain places around the world have hurricanes and other places don't. For example, Southern California, right by an ocean, very, very rarely has a hurricane. In fact, the only hurricane that I know of on record in Southern California was in San Diego back in the early 1800s. Now, this doesn't mean we don't have remnants of hurricanes in this area, but one of the reasons why we don't have hurricanes often is that our water temperature is not above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is one of the first ingredients. Ocean water must be at least Eight, sorry, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. You must also have an existing low pressure, winds con uh, converging at the surface near the ocean. That causes air to rise, and with the water being so warm, that provides a lot of humidity for clouds and rain. We also have to have air diverging out of the top of the system. In fact, sometimes we actually can get a high pressure system on top of the hurricane and that system is visible on satellite. And also one of the biggest things we need is we need very light winds around the hurricane, not in the hurricane, obviously, because some of the strongest winds on earth are in a hurricane, but we need winds um, outside of the hurricane to be very light don't need something called wind shear or vertical wind shear. Hurricanes go through different stages and not all uh, tropical systems actually make it to a hurricane level. For example, if we see a, an organized system that has wind speeds less than 38 miles per hour, then we call that a tropical depression. We have to have some kind of circulation. And that circulation, by the way, is due to the Coriolis effect, which we talked about in chapter five. Once it becomes a tropical storm, where winds are between 38 and 74 miles per hour, we start to name the storms. And naming schemes come up through various agencies, but in, in and around North America, we have uh, the National Hurricane Center and they create uh, male and female names. If the winds become greater than 74 miles per hour, that's when we get a hurricane. And often a hurricane on a satellite will have a very distinct eye. And we'll talk about the differences between the eye and the eye wall in a minute here. So here is a cross section of a hurricane. This is a schematic of, let's say, a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. We could say it's Hurricane Katrina. By the way, up in the upper left-hand corner is the track of Hurricane Katrina. As you could tell, it actually hit Florida first. And then it, as we all know, hit Mississippi, Louisiana, and especially New Orleans very hard. But we'll talk more about that a little bit later. What a hurricane really consists of are bands of rain. And these rain systems, especially near the eye, are so tall that they have the same height as a cumulonimbus cloud. They're a collection of cumulonimbus clouds, actually. Right at the eye wall 
is where we have the strongest winds and some of the largest potential for flooding. However, inside the eye, it's very calm. In fact, if you are unlucky enough to actually go through a hurricane and hit the eye, or go experience the eye, you would actually notice that it's calm. And if it's sunny outside, you'd see the sun, or I should say daytime outside, you'd see the sun, or at night, you might see the stars. You gotta be aware because people in the past have thought that the hurricane was over. But you might have, let's say, on this side of the hurricane, 200 mile per hour winds, let's say, coming from the east. And then on the other side, 200 mile per hour winds coming from the west. So you've got to be very careful. Now, hurricanes, because of the Coriolis effect, will rotate counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. Notice that the outflow on top, which comes out of a high pressure system on top, is flowing clockwise but the majority of this system is counterclockwise. Not all parts of a hurricane are the same. For example, if we have a hurricane here that's on the east coast heading toward New England, and it's rotating counterclockwise, but it's moving north, let's say 25, mile, or 25 knots, this side of the hurricane will have the rotational speed aligned with the direction of the uh, movement. So you would actually have 125 knots. We're assuming that the circulation is 100 knots. So you have 100 plus 25, 125 knots. However, on the other side, the wind speed would be less, 100 minus 25, 75 knots. We call this section right here in the upper right, the right front quadrant which has the greatest potential for damage, not just because of wind, because this is also the part where we can get extreme storm surge and flooding. Now you might be wondering what the difference is between a hurricane, a typhoon, and a cyclone. Cyclone in general is a generic name for a large circulation. But when it comes to tropical systems, we call these large systems hurricanes if they're in the Eastern Pacific or in the Atlantic Ocean, north, uh, north of the equator. We call them typhoons in the Western Pacific. And we just call them cyclones in the Southern Hemisphere and in around Australia or in the Indian Ocean. There's a long history between that, but just keep in mind that hurricanes, typhoons, and cyclones are essentially the same thing it's just geography gives it a different name. One particular typhoon a few years ago that wreaked damage, uh, did a lot of damage uh, near the Philippines was Typhoon Haiyan. Now, most eyes of a hurricane are maybe 15, 20 miles wide. This hurricane was so large that the eye was 50 miles wide and the wind gusts were I think about 230 miles per hour. So let's talk about other notable hurricanes. Hurricane Katrina is still one of the worst in our nation, not just because of <clears throat> its power, but what it has done to uh, New Orleans and the levee system there. So back in August 2005, there was a Category 5 hurricane when it was still in the Gulf of Mexico. Luckily, it was downgraded to a, to a Category 3, but it still did a lot of damage. So it first started in the Caribbean, and it was relatively weak over Florida, but then it gained strength when it moved into the Gulf of Mexico. It was only the second landfall of a major hurricane near the very low-lying New Orleans. And unfortunately, we have storm surge. But even though it's a storm surge, what really happened was the levees that keep most of the Lake Pontchartrain water at, uh, at a safe distance had broken and flooded much of the, um, unfortunately, impoverished areas of the city. 80% of the city at one point was flooded. So you might be wondering, what is the most 
dangerous part of a hurricane? Most people would say the wind, but actually flooding is the number one most damaging effect of a hurricane. Then a little bit more recently, we have Superstorm Sandy. What's interesting about Sandy was that it was a it was technically a post-tropical cyclone. So it wasn't just a hurricane, it was a hurricane and an extra tropical cyclone that merged together. And it went a different way. Most of the times when hurricanes go up to New England, they move off to the east. This one, because of weather systems around the area, around New England and, and the mid-Atlantic states, it forced it to move west. It was a very weak system in terms of wind, but because of storm surge and heavy rain, it caused a lot of damage, especially in New York and New Jersey. So we have a couple of pictures here of before and after. We actually just have two pictures, one before, one after of a pier. And um, altogether, we had $60 billion worth of damage. So let's switch gears now. We're still talking about atmospheric disturbances, and we're going to get into something called a thunderstorm. Hurricanes are made up of thunderstorms, at least initially. What's interesting about hurricanes is there's very little lightning in most hurricanes. So then what exactly is a thunderstorm? Well, in the most strict sense, it's essentially just a storm that has lightning and thunder. Severe thunderstorms, which are much more dangerous, they have a little bit more of a, a uh, arbitrary but important definition. This, this definition is, according, is based off of the National Weather Service. It's one with large hail, wind gusts greater than 58 miles per hour, or one that has a tornado. In terms of a spatial distribution of thunderstorms, as you can tell, Florida is number one when it comes to thunderstorms. Which state do you think has the least, at least within the lower 48? You're right, right here in Southern California, or I should just say in California in general. Southern California actually has a few more thunderstorms than the central coast. And that's mainly because of the monsoonal influence that we get in the mountains and deserts in the summertime. So if you're afraid of lightning, which there are people out there that have a phobia of lightning, Florida is not a place that you want to be. So what exactly causes lightning and thunder? Lightning in general is a very large uh, discharge of electricity. And these are in mature thunderstorms. And lightning can actually be within clouds, which most of the time, thank goodness, uh, lightning stays within a cloud. It can go from one cloud to another, and then of course it can go from cloud to ground. Thunder is the explosive expansion, the, the sudden expansion of air because it was heated so quickly by the intense uh, heat of the lightning stroke. In fact, lightning, the temperature of lightning is greater than the surface of the sun. So imagine that, imagine air being heated up to 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and then suddenly that, that heat source is gone, and it collapses onto itself and creates thunder. And within these cumulonimbus clouds, the thunderstorm clouds, we have a mixture of ice crystals, supercooled water, and they help uh, provide a distribution of electrical charges. And what we typically see is we have much of the lighter ice crystals that have a positive charge that get drawn up to the top of the thunderstorms. And in one section of the cloud, we can get larger particles, let's say hailstones, that are negatively charged. If we get a, a, a large separation of, uh, and a distribution like this, we can get lightning because remember, Nature doesn't like imbalance. Now, if we have a tree down here that is positively charged and we have, and it's underneath a negatively charged part of a cloud, that's another way we can get lightning. Question, do most people survive lightning strikes? The answer, surprisingly, is yes. 
Unfortunately, though, they're quite damaged. Now let's go into tornadoes. Tornadoes are one of my favorite types of severe weather. Growing up in the Midwest and going to school at the University of Oklahoma, I have had some opportunity to chase severe weather with tornadoes. Now the geography of tornadoes is a bit different than the geography of lightning. Most lightning is found within Florida. However, central Oklahoma, if we're talking about the average number of tornadoes that we see per um, unit area, we'll just keep the units pretty, um, uh, we'll keep it unitless for now. Central Oklahoma has the highest incidence of tornadic activity. But this whole section right here in the middle of our country, because of its unique geography, is prone to tornadoes. One of the reasons why is that we have warm Gulf of Mexico air coming from the south going toward the no north at the surface, and then air that's moving away from the Rocky Mountains higher up in the atmosphere is cold and dry. So we have a little bit of a, what we call vertical wind shear in this area that can set up and create tornadoes. Tornadoes, the, the peak of tornadoes in terms of throughout the year is in May. And we see, um, so spring has the highest um, uh, number of tornadoes and winter typically has the lowest. We have various pictures of a tornado. Tornadoes come in various sizes. Some are very small, but can still do quite a bit of damage, as you can see right here. The largest tornado, I think, on record is about two and a half miles wide, but most tornadoes are less than a mile wide. Most tornadoes last, on average, about 10 minutes, and most tornadoes are quite weak. It's the very strong tornadoes that get the attention of scientists and the media, and unfortunately, are the ones that cause the most casualties. So I talked about a big picture. I looked at the big picture weather um, systems that can uh, create tornadoes. We have, you know, within the Great Plains of the United States, the middle part of our country, you know, we have vertical wind shear that sets up. More specifically, how does a tornado form? Actually. No one knows exactly how a tornado can form, but we know more than just vertical wind shear. So one of the things that we need, as you can see in this picture, is we need rotation in that in a thunderstorm. And vertical wind shear is one of those ways that we can get rotation. As you can see here, this part of the cloud is actually something called a mesocyclone. It's rotating. And that rotation, for some reason or another, every once in a while will be strong enough to spawn a lower level rotation all the way to the ground. There are theories as to how that works, and we're going to get into a little bit of that, but not too much. So how does this rotation work? Well, we have vertical wind shear that creates rotation along a horizontal axis at first. So we have this area right here. But then because thunderstorms have extremely unstable air, they could have updrafts. Actually, uh, it's like a river of air moving up, sometimes as fast as 100 miles per hour. And if that updraft is co-located with one of these uh, spinning columns of air, then we have our mesocyclone. Now, if we have around the mesocyclone some air that comes down, it can actually constrict the large scale, I should say larger scale rotation. And that's one theory. If you constrict it, just like an ice skater, if you have an ice skater that's spinning and suddenly the arms come inward, the ice skater spins faster. So if we can get this rotation down here to spin faster, that it may produce a tornado. That's one of several theories that we have on tornado formation. So again, mesocyclone is just the mid part, mid level tropospheric rotation and tornadoes are the part that actually has to hit the ground. 
That's the definition of a tornado. Here's another way of looking at it. So we have the mesoscale and the updraft. We have a rotating updraft in the middle of that thunderstorm. If we get a downdraft, especially if you get two downdrafts, which is very typical of severe weather, that can pinch that rotation, cause it to constrict, and eventually create a tornado. Now, a mesocyclone, on average, just more than 50% of them produce tornadoes. So what, what's interesting is we can see these mesocyclones on radar. And what we do is we, we see the mesocyclone and we put out a tornado warning, but we usually say it's a Doppler indicated tornado warning because unless someone's actually on the ground and, and sees the tornado, we don't always know for sure, but it's better safe than sorry. Winds inside a tornado can actually be much stronger than that of a hurricane. So we can have very weak tornadoes, which California actually has weak tornadoes. We've had them. In fact, one time we had a Category 2 tornado. I shouldn't say category. Um, an F, we call them F2 back in 1983 when it happened. Now we call it EF because it's been enhanced, the enhanced Fujita scale that came out in 2007. We had one go through downtown Los Angeles. Now, the ones that do the most damage are the ones with wind speeds well over one or 200 miles per hour. The highest recorded wind speed was 318 miles per hour. And that can destroy well-built houses, to, uh, completely take them off of their foundations. Here's an example of, I believe, an EF4 tornado. It basically tossed this car as if it was a toy. This is the, the kind of gruesome things that you can see um, and you probably have seen already when it comes to tornadoes. And here's a big picture of, um, of a factory being completely destroyed by a tornado. This one was in Illinois, um, I believe back in, um, I think about 10 years ago. And so luckily most tornadoes are small. Most tornadoes happen in areas where, mo where people don't live. But the big ones through populated areas are very unfortunate and are the ones that we have to, um, that they get the attention and uh, not just the attention of the media, but of scientists so that they can help um, understand tornadoes better and so we can better predict them and save lives.